The Staten Island Ferry is both an iconic symbol of New York City and an invaluable asset to the borough's commuters, serving as Staten Island's primary mass transit connection to Manhattan. But in recent years, the once reliable operation has fallen into disarray, with short staffing, labor disputes, and inconsistent service becoming the norm. Even though you guys are going on strike, have some type of consideration for the people that live in Staten Island, have to go all the way to Manhattan to make a living. But you know, it's, it's the scary part is it's so crowded coming back and forth to the city yes. because of the tourists. Yes. Yeah. So it scares them. Yes. And so it's not only for our safety, it's it, for it's their the safety, safety too. And the, the thing that gets me too is that you think these overnight runs don't matter to people. It's like, oh, it's just drunk people coming back from the city right time. And this is something I criticized de Blasio about. These are people, off shift workers. These are hotel workers. These are you know, transit workers, maids, people like that who are coming in. They, they, maybe they're coming home at four o'clock in the morning. Police officers, firefighters, nurses, municipal workers. You know, they come home, like, I gotta wait an hour and a half. And don't forget that they say, oh, running every hour. I mean, we've all heard anecdotal, I'm sure you've got emails that I have for people too. I took an Uber down to the boat because I knew the boat was coming at three o'clock in the morning. The boat didn't go until four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, 4 30. Because who's looking? Who cares? Welcome to the Staten Island Advances from the Scene, a podcast bringing you an inside look at the biggest stories on Staten Island with the reporters who cover them. I'm your host, Eric Bascom, and this week I'm joined by Staten Island Advance senior opinions writer Tom Robleski to discuss the ongoing service issues that have plagued the Staten Island Ferry since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Thanks for joining me today, Tom. I always appreciate you coming on to talk transportation issues with me since, you know, you're the opinion writer and I'm the beat writer, so you can comment on these things a little differently than I can. And, and from, say the things that you want to say, you're dying to say. Right, sometimes. right. And from what I understand, the transportation beat has been treating you pretty well. It's been uh, treating me very well lately. As anything with speed cameras lately seems to really be hitting the mark, especially this thing with the Verrazano. We could do a whole separate show uh, on, on that as well. But yes, absolutely. It's always, I and mean, I do appreciate your work. And I always appreciate uh, the invitation to come on. Of course, yeah. And if the speed cameras on the Verrazano thing you mentioned, there's also the that, that was in the state budget proposal from the governor. And mm -hmm. then another thing in there was uh, allowing New York City to lower its speed limits even further from 25 to 20, which is another one that's just crazy. So if those things do end up passing, I'm sure we will have a whole nother podcast just talking about. And, and, and also wait for them to say, well, okay, 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, you get a ticket. Now it's going to be six miles an hour. Right. Now it's going to be five miles an hour. There's a lot of things they can still do. Yeah, exactly. And so keep an eye out. Out for those and uh you can you can keep tabs on my reporting i'll have all the updates on that and then uh we can discuss it when it becomes a little more relevant if it does get passed into law mm -hmm. the reason i wanted to have you on today is you know as we said in the open talking about the staten island ferry i mean this is something that i've been reporting on for three years now right mm -hmm. since the, the start of the pandemic is what got this going and so i wanted to first just do a, a general overview so Originally, when the pandemic started, ridership just plummeted on the ferry. They were down. I think uh, at the time, it was former Mayor Bill de Blasio. He said that the ridership was at about 14% of mm -hmm. what it once was, which is just crazy low because, you know, the stay-at-home waters, no one's going to work. And so it makes sense. So with that low of ridership, they were like, all right, let's move to hourly service for now. Let's try and match the ridership. Do we really need boats running every half hour, every 15 minutes during rush hour if we've only got... 15% of the people right. going on them. So it kind of made sense there. Um, even though it was against the law, but anyway. Even though I, and we will get to the law right. part of it because I'm very curious to, to hear what you have to say about, about some of that stuff. But so the city incrementally restores the rush hour service um, as more and more people start going back to work. We finally get back to full service in August, 2021. Mm -hmm. And pretty much as soon as that happens, less than two weeks later, we start seeing these service reductions of like, oh, well, actually today the ferry is going to run hourly during the overnight or it's going to run on a modified schedule during rush hour or whatever it is. And the, the city kind of first acknowledges the staffing issue that they're having. Right. And so th this is a big thing at the ferry where they don't have enough staff to run the boats right now. And we heard shortly after that the, the union who represents these people, they reached out to us and said, hey, you know why there's such a big problem with staffing right. at the ferry? Because we haven't had a new contract in 12 years and we haven't gotten any raises and morale is low and no one wants to work here and people come and they leave and whatever. And so it, what originally started as just kind of a, oh, what's going on with the ferry? We really need some more service. Turned into now this back and forth, he said, she said, long contract dispute. Yeah, but sort but of thing. The, 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 the most puzzling thing about all of this is now we've had a contract dispute, was it 13 years now? Yeah, I think, I think with 2023, yeah. So at the beginning 13. of the pandemic, we're in eight or nine years of, of a contract dispute. 
But before the pandemic, service was fine. We never heard any of this at all. I understand things drag mm -hmm. on, on. So why was it all of a sudden, I understand people didn't go to work and, and, and if they're not making money, where did all the staffing, where did all the staffers go? I know. Did they, 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 did they get other jobs? In, because there were other cities that were locked down even harder. They always bring up Seattle, right? Seattle is like, like the, the, you know, the, the golden place where people go and they right. get paid these, these, these ferry workers and these captains and everything else. Well, they had stricter lockdowns in, in many respects than, than we did in, in some places. So where did all these folks go and why did it become a chronic problem when it was already an eight-year-old or nine-year-old contract dispute? Why did it become this critical thing where you can't keep a boat running? That's, that's been puzzling to me. I think one thing that I've heard from the union, when the pandemic happened, a lot of people wanted out, right? Just generally speaking, you had older people who retired. Okay. You had people who maybe wanted to leave the public sector for a private job where you're not around as many people. You know, Staten Island Ferry, when they are running at full capacity, which as we mentioned, they still are not. It's crowded. There's tons of people. If you have health concerns, you're immunocompromised, maybe that's part of it. If you're older, you don't feel like putting yourself at risk. You're just kind of over it. You don't want to be working through the pandemic. You retire. So from, from what I hear, there was some kind of uh, some sort of attrition in that first year or two of the of the pandemic. I mean, I've been covering transportation for us since 2017. I don't remember this every other day of the ferry services right. reduced because yeah. we don't have staffing. It is curious that it kind of happens all at once, right? And, and are we really on the knife edge of staffing in the city of New York with DOT where, okay, let's, let's say what you say happens. You know, let's say however many guys or gals leave the job. Mm -hmm. That's enough to make it so that, you know, we can't run boats except every hour. We can't run rush hour boats. You know, we can't run boats overnight. Are we on that much of a knife edge? And and you're telling me that there's not folks out there with their pilot's licenses coming from other places who don't want to work in another industry. It's like, well, this is good job, pension, you know, benefits, right. whatever else. I'm a young guy. I want to get into this. It's a, what is it? A five mile trip back and forth. Takes you 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's like, like those ice road, you know, kind of uh, shows where people are out there fishing on boats and they're in dangerous situations. It's a fairly stable, safe up until the incident we had, whatever yeah. we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me that, you know, okay, so people leave and, and the salaries are really that bad in the city of New York? I mean, I, I guess it could be, but to that degree where you can't find, how many people are going to work? Yeah. How many people, and I realize this is a specialized gig, but I mean, it just, to me, it just, the, the, the whole thing, not to make a pun, the whole thing sounds fishy. Yeah. And so I think that uh, part of the issue, as you mentioned, is that these people need to be specially trained and qualified. They need U.S. Coast Guard certification. So the the current pool of, of applicants is kind of small. They've also, the DOT has repeatedly noted that there is a national maritime worker shortage. They are not the only people apparently struggling to fill these roles. In terms of the staffing being kind of the, on a knife's edge, as you said, the, the problem is, and this is another thing that the DOT keeps reiterating to me, is that these they they are legally required to staff certain positions for each run on the ferry so they need to have at least one captain assistant captain one marine oiler one marine engineer and I, I, i'm missing one right now too so it's things like that but yeah it does appear that the staffing right now is in such a situation that if you have your person call out who is supposed to be your assistant captain for that boat and you don't have another assistant captain to fill in and assistant captains, you know, all of them really, they have these very strict rules on how many hours they can work in a week, how right. much they, right. when they can work, when they need time off. And so uh, from the way that they, uh, uh, you know, explain it to me is that if someone calls out in one of those positions, they likely need to reduce service because they don't have enough people to, to do that based on the fact that they need to be specially trained, based on the fact that they can only operate a certain amount of shifts before they need to take a break and, right. and all of that kind of stuff. But it is just... Um, you've got the Coast Guard crawling up your neck because the Coast Guard is going to be overseeing everything. You've got to, you've got to answer to them. You've got to answer to the state. You've got to, I, I understand all of that, but we're really at that... We're really at that chronic point. We're, we're not at that chronic point with other services. And I get it. I get what the, what the DOT says, and, and, I, and I believe what they say. That this could be a national thing, but but something's got to change. If, if one guy calls out sick or doesn't want to be on a boat anymore because of lingering COVID fears or whatever else, mm -hmm. then we got to figure out something else. Yeah, no, agreed. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the union stance here and, and what we've been hearing from them. So their claim is that they are significantly underpaid, and that's why the city has struggled to recruit new people and retain the talent that's already there. So the examples that they've given us, and you, you mentioned this before with Seattle, the Washington State Ferry, their captains make about 60 to 65 an hour. 
Uh, whereas the Staten Island Ferry captains make about 40 an hour. So that's, they're making 50% less than, than the people in the other parts of the I'm country. I'm surprised to hear that, frankly. I really am in, in this marketplace that usually New York salaries are better. Yeah, you would think so, right? And so uh, that that was surprising to me as well. And so the union came in and, and they sat down with us for an edit board a while ago. And we, we got to speak with some of their people and hear their side of it. So I'm curious your thoughts on on just this whole contract dispute that's now going on its 13th year. I mean, you've been covering New York City and politics and all this stuff for much longer than I have. So I'm curious if you've ever even seen this kind of thing before, like a contract dispute that lasts over a decade. It seems like they typically try to resolve these things in pretty short order to avoid these types of situations. Well, the other, the only other one I remember, and, and again, I didn't do labor issues as much, but the, the uh, police officers were without a contract for a long time. I think this was with Bloomberg, and it was like no zeros for heroes. They wanted to give them nothing, nothing, and then give them a lot like yeah. as, as the contract went forward. People weren't even aware of the situation with the with the ferry workers and, and, and the captains. And, and again, I understand these are specialized people and usually you have a contract negotiation. And I know that, that they said the uh, mayor de Blasio made them an offer. They didn't like the offer. Right. So, but then okay, you come back with a counter offer. Like they say, you know, everybody gets something, nobody gets everything that they want. The right. city doesn't get everything and, and whatever else. So it, it's, it's now going into a, I guess it's a second mayoral administration. Although it was, was this tail end of Bloomberg? We're talking about yeah. It was they, they claim Bloomberg didn't want to negotiate. He left everything to De Blasio. Yeah, because he was on his way out. He was on his way out the door. It was a lot of things that happened. Sandy stuff and other things that that Bloomberg got you know criticized for kind of leaving on the on the table. Somewhere along the line, someone has to. Eat. I mean, maybe there's mediation or I don't know. I know they, they they talked about mediation. They do have a mediator right now that they've been working with, but so, it's been a while now. I think it was August that they announced that they would be. Um, bringing in a third party mediator and it still seems pretty quiet. I haven't heard much from the city. I haven't heard much from the union in terms of progress here. And only affects that now. So that's a play forgotten borrow poor card, although but the, the 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 temperature around something like this doesn't really come to a boil because it really only affects us and it affects, I guess, tourism and whatever else. Most of the tourists are there in the daytime. They're not riding the boat overnight or coming home from a job, mm -hmm. a midnight job or whatever else or or something like that. So it, it's kind of hard to generate a lot of heat around something like this when it only but but still it's you know tens of thousands of people thousands of people on, on a boat every day yeah so you know we'll be right back the mayor of maple avenue is a powerful multi-part podcast about sean sinnesy a victim of former penn state football coach jerry sandusky who was arrested 10 years ago for numerous child sexual abuse charges the podcast series is written and hosted by pulitzer prize winning reporter sarah Gannam who takes listeners into the world of addiction rehabilitation, where society can be quick to celebrate the consequences for abusers while not addressing the needs of their victims. Subscribe now to The Mayor of Maple Avenue wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and you know, that's actually something that I wanted to ask you about too, just the, the lack of... of coverage on this issue across New York City outside of right here. I joke sometimes with our editors, I am the only person who cares about the Staten Island Ferry right now in New York City because I'm doing all of this reporting on it on a constant basis for years straight. The other outlets, the Times, the Post, the Daily News, they're pretty quiet on this front. When the, when the Sandy Ground caught fire, we got an article. Well, that's too, right, exactly. And we'll right. get to that later. But, you know, this union dispute, I mean, they had, I think there was one or two Post articles when they something about when the new boats came in and the union right. was unhappy with the training and all of that kind of stuff. I've written legitimately dozens of articles about this. It, it is just like such a huge issue and it's affecting so many people across New York City, not even just Staten Islanders in this way. And so for me, it's frustrating to see that the rest of the city, and again, not to, to harp on the Forgotten Borough thing, but it does feel as though we here at the Staten Island Advance are the only people who care about getting the ferry running right. Well, especially when a, a paper like the New York Times and the Daily News, will leave the post aside, are, are, are so much cool into labor unions mm -hmm. and labor union issues, municipal labor union issues. The only other publication I would imagine has any interest in this is the chief, right? Because they, they cover all the, the city unions. That's a, a city union targeted paper. But I don't see it anywhere else either. I don't see other, you know, lo regional publications taking it on. And again, it, it only affects us. So listen, other newspapers, you made the point yourself, you know, just a minute ago, when there's a disaster, 
or somebody is let out of office in handcuffs, mm -hmm. or you've got a crooked politician or somebody else, then they come out here and they kind of land in full force. And then it's kind of like the sociology, they, they cover us like we're a zoo. Right. right? Here's what's going on on weird Staten uh, Island. Island. On, yeah. You know, the DeSantis, some of the DeSantis coverage was like that as well, sort of, you know, it's, it's almost like they, they come out here and go, hmm, this interesting place we hear of called Staten Island, <laughs> where people actually do live, if you didn't know. So mm -hmm. I think when you say, okay, so you can't commute back and forth or, and the, the thing that gets me too is that you think these overnight runs don't matter to people. It's like, oh, it's just drunk people coming back from the city, right? It's not. Even though you guys are going on strike, have some type of consideration for the people that live in Staten Island, have to go all the way to Manhattan to make a living. But you know, it's, it's the scary part is it's so crowded coming back and forth to the city yes. because of the tourists. Yes. Yeah. So it scares them. Yes. And so it's not only for our safety, it's it for their the safety, safety too. Well. Something I criticized de Blasio about, you know, the champion of the, of the working uh, man and woman and everything else, was that these are people, off shift workers, these are hotel workers, these are, you know, transit workers, maids, people like that who are coming in. They, they, maybe they're coming on at four o'clock in the morning. They work in eight to four. Yeah. They work a 12 to eight shift in the morning. Police officers, firefighters, nurses, municipal workers, you know, they come home, they're like, I got to wait an hour and a half. And don't forget that they say, oh, running every hour. We've all heard anecdotal, I'm sure you've got emails that yeah. I have from people too. You know, I, I, I took an Uber down to the, 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 the subway screwed me. I took an Uber down to the boat because I knew the boat was coming at three o'clock in the morning. Boat didn't come until four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Four thirty. Because who's looking and who cares? Well, that's the other thing too, with the hourly aspect of it during the overnight is you miss the boat by five minutes and you're there for 55 minutes waiting. I mean, it's kind of... Well, people of my generation are used to that because it was, it was always 1130 was the last boat on the half hour right. coming out of Manhattan. So and I went to college in Manhattan. So you knew you missed that 11:30 boat, 12:30, 1:30, 2:30. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, and sometimes you. But mostly it was at least that was more reliable than what I'm hearing is going on now, where it's like maybe it's 1:30, maybe it's going to be 10 after two, quarter after two, 2:30. I mean, I've gotten emails from people. I'm sure you have as well. Yeah, and you know, while we're kind of on this issue of of kind of the the Staten Island aspect of it, right? You know, I've heard from some people, uh, some union people, who have said that you know if this ferry was connected to another borough we wouldn't be having this issue they wouldn't let this continue i actually just spoke with the borough president um the other day uh he had a transportation mm -hmm. summit at borough hall we got to touch on a bunch of different issues but his point was like if there were service reductions ongoing for three straight years affecting the subway system, mm -hmm. do you think that they wouldn't have figured that out by now? <laughs> and I feel like that's kind of a common sentiment that's that's held by people here is that uh you know if this was anyone else, they would care more. And that that's kind of uh, how it feels right now. Well, that, and also to be fair, the subways have had their share of problems over the last couple of years, including, you know, if you're going out into the city and you want to come home by the city, you better check that MTA website to make sure there's yeah. not track work going on, the train's not, you know, going sideways. But yeah, I, 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 I agree 100%. And I think that, listen, like with a red voting, Republican voting borough out here, you know, no mayor needs Staten Island's votes, basically. I mean, you have the exceptions like Giuliani and Bloomberg in recent years. They're the exception that kind of proves the rule. And, you know, Adams said it would be different under him. I kind of don't see much of a difference in terms of the attention he pays in. We could talk about the, the parade controversy as well, kind of a, a, a gold, you know, silver platter issue for, yeah. you know, for a liberal Democrat to jump on. Felt like and, a layup. And it, that would be absolutely an unguarded net, you know, for, you know, completely. And, and and there's nothing. But with the ferry, I think it's true too, because like, hey, listen, I, I need this. If, if more officials needed it to get home, then right. then then you'd have, you'd have this thing would be fixed. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, another thing that that you know you touched on earlier, but I wanted to get into a little more is that these service reductions appear in some way to be violating New York City's local laws. That is all plans. That, yeah, it, it's, it's 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 black letter law that, that that this is this is you're supposed to have the every thirty minutes and and you know. I'm, Monado is now in the Adams administration. I'd love to be able to fly on the wall and hear him talk about it. Yeah, you know, it it, it, was, it, it was it was a very big deal. It was one of the last things that got done under Bloomberg in, in thirteen. They uh, they they agreed that you're going to have half hour service round the clock, twenty four seven. And then the question was, well, is De Blasio going to fund it? Because that's always that's always the the mm -hmm. flying. Like, De Blasio funds it, so it's a it's a city law. Yeah. So where where's the so where's 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 the ACLU? Where's the 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 you know the, the law firms that do these kind of things? Where are even our locals who sued over yellow buses and sued? Not 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 to say that they're not doing a job, but I'm saying where do they say like, hey, let's go to court 
and let's figure this. It's the same thing with the parade. Let's go to court. Let's figure it out and see if it really is. Well, there's nothing that we can that we can do about this because they're breaking every, every day. That service is not. They're breaking all. They're not getting penalized. They're not getting fined. And again, people seem to go. They kind of they kind of shrug. Yeah, and that and that's kind of where I'm landing on it as well. And it's it's just kind of confusing to me because. You know, during the pandemic, the city was claiming that there was emergency provisions that allow them to bypass those laws during uh, public right. health emergencies right. Emergency. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so that makes sense. But at this point, I mean, the pandemic is, I don't, I, I, should, I don't want to say over, but essentially, I mean, the, the mandates have been lifted. It's falling in the rear view mirror. It's, it's pretty right. in the rear view. So, but we still don't have any answer from the city on why they're allowed to keep violating this law. And then when, I, you know, I just mentioned that Borough Hall Transportation Summit thing, I asked them, the electeds who were there, and it was uh, Borough President Fasella, uh, Councilman Carr, and uh uh, Congresswoman Nicole Malliotakis, who obviously at the federal level, a little different at this point. But, you know, I asked them, like, why aren't the elected doing more about this? Right. Like, they are clearly continuing to break the law. Why are you not, like you said, wh- why not sue the city? Why not? You, you know, they've made a bigger stink over other things. That's how the landfill got closed out of, that, out of that same borough hall, not the same borough president, obviously, but that's, and they said, it's never going to, and I remember it, it's never going to work. And this was Molinari suing. Giuliani, mm-hmm. you know, the pals. So, and let me, let me be clear. I, I didn't have that much of a problem with changing in, in, in 2020. Nobody wants to ride on the boat. Nobody was going into work. Right. And the boat is one of those places like a subway where you can, you're, you're sitting, you know, knee to knee sometimes on those early boats, the 720, the eight o'clock, mm-hmm. everybody's on it. So I didn't have a problem with that, but keeping it going, I did have a problem with And when it finally ended, it's like, oh, you know, we all breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, great. And then all of a sudden this mess seems to be like well we didn't we didn't have that problem but by the way now we've always had this problem and now this is going to be our new problem with the ferry mm-hmm. and again so i mean you know our all has resources other people have resources these elected officials some of them are already attorneys there are a lot more friendly republican judges in state supreme court where these things mm-hmm. land on their desk now than there used to be even 10 15 years ago so what you take your shot yeah, I've been uh, I've been very surprised by that aspect of it. And so something else that I wanted to touch on was on New Year's Eve, there was this issue where they were so, so short staffed, excuse me, that they just could not run the, the Staten Island ferry boats. But considering it's New Year's Eve and people are back and forth to the city and that stuff, they're like, oh, well, we have to provide some sort of service. Right. Okay. And so they end up. Uh, bringing in the smaller NYC ferry vessels, which run the fast ferry service um, out of St. George, the smaller dock on the sign mm-hmm. by the ball field. And, but they're using them to run Staten Island ferry service. They're docking them in the Staten Island, in the St. George terminal. They're doing all this stuff. And so it, it's a really weird situation. The, the unions reached out, the union reached out to me. They were upset because, you know, claiming basically union busting that they're bringing in outside crews and staff to work their jobs right and so they're concerned about that they were concerned about some of the safety stuff of mm-hmm. the smaller boats having to link up to the bigger docks and not not sure and it wasn't a great weather night as well it wasn't a great weather right. night there was ada concerns about accessibility of getting on the boat because everything wasn't really locking in right because it's designed for boats that are 10 times the size or whatever it is so I'm just kind of curious, the whole situation was so strange, just your general thoughts on it. And if you've ever seen other things like this in the city where the public services, they don't have enough to run it. So they bring in a private company on like a stopgap. I, 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 I mean, I mean, the city obviously has an agreement with, with these people. So it's, it's, but to me, that's not something that should ever happen. It's to me, that's kind of frightening. Yeah, actually it's frightening to me that they're bringing these boats like it's like bringing it's like putting a little boat in your tub size right. differential yeah. of, of, of things and you know that it's not meant for and again the fact that we are that much we are on that much of a knife is where listen used to be you want to work on new year's eve because you're going to make the overtime you're going to make is ridiculous Absolutely. so it's like well you know i want to be so we don't have enough staff to do that to me it, 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 i always kind of come down and maybe this is the the, the, the old school charles to me there's, there's blame on both sides mm-hmm. you know maybe you're trying to be low bold maybe you want more every every union negotiation they want everything that they can get for their members every city nego- from their side they want to save as much money as they can i get that the fact that for 13 years you, you can't make an agreement first of all if i was a union guy or gal i'd be like hey where's my contract i'd right. be going to my leadership i'd be saying Where's, well, I'm holding out for the best, holding out for the best thing. I, 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 I want to so get me a raise. Yeah, I give me a raise and I want to work. And if you can't get me a raise from this guy, 
after not being able to get me a raise for eight years. From the other guy. From the other guy. And for two or three years from the guy before that, that's your job. That's not my job. And and if you're the, the mayor's going to be, okay, I want everybody in a room and, and I want to, I want to sort this out. And I don't know what, and, and the fact that you, you're running these, I mean, yeah, listen, the fast ferries are fine for what they do. They're not made for that kind of volume. No, absolutely. You know, and especially on a night where it was, it was kind of rainy, it was a little sleety and everything mm -hmm. else. And people, it was like the uh, the Sandy Ground thing. It was it was kind of like, a, this is not the way things should be done. And and what, and again, it, it's mind boggling why it's being done. And people kind of like, oh yeah, that's now, and I'm afraid it becomes the new normal. Yeah. You know, because no, because nobody's holding anybody accountable for it. So I wanted to touch on one last thing before we go, and you had mentioned this before, we talked about it a little bit, but the the fire on the Sandy Ground, which is the, one of the newest boats, it's part of this Alice class uh, of boats that we just received. Very expensive, very nice looking, very new, modern amenities. They look great. I've been to the um, the commissioning ceremonies for some of them. I've gone and ridden them back and forth. The seats uh, are a little funky, aren't they? The, the angle. The kind of yeah, angle, yeah. The seat, that's, that's the one, one I noticed. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know if it's a hostile architecture kind of thing to try and keep people from sleeping on the boats or... Uh, <laughs> Or, or brutalist design. Or yeah, something. right. Yeah, whichever, whatever your favorite term is for that. But so the Sandy Ground, this really scary situation we saw on December 22nd, which of course was right before the Christmas holidays too. So we got to rush into all this coverage mm -hmm. with like a day or two left. Um, mm -hmm. But so the, the Sandy Ground is coming back to Staten Island during the evening rush hour and a engine fire breaks out in the room. And so from what we hear from people on the boat, smoke starts to come out of the room seeping out from under the door. People get very nervous. They don't know what's going on. Next thing you know, people are throwing life vests at mm -hmm. them and they're getting then evacuated onto tugboats and the smaller NYC ferry boats that we talked about earlier came to to help out. And so obviously it was a very scary situation for, for everyone involved here. Of particular concern is that this is one of the brand new boats yeah. that we just paid, you know, a hundred million dollars for or whatever the exact total was. It's something around there. And so I'm curious, one thing that came out after this was everyone was like, well, are we sure that the Alice boat's not going to have the same issue? Because that one's currently in service. I'm curious, just one, your thoughts on the entire incident and, and, and then whether you agree that the Alice boat should have been taken out of service while they've finished this investigation. Because to my knowledge, we still don't know exactly what caused. They, they said it might have been a fuel leak, but they haven't completed their investigation on the sandy ground. And yet they're still letting the Alice boat bring passengers back and forth every day. Well, I was lucky enough to be called in to help cover that. It was the first time I did breaking news, and I can't remember. Oh wow! And it's and it's it, and it's it was staggering. You run down to and and people standing there with the life vests on when it's when it's working. It is the most ordinary thing in a lot of Staten Island commuters' lives. You get on the boat, you've got your book, you've got your coffee, you, you get a tall boy or whatever, and and, and so f to have that happen especially on a new boat. I mean, how many times do we take these Kennedy boats? I was taking the Kennedy boats back in the 80s. Yeah. To, and they stayed on forever, the, the uh, Barberry class, the Newhouse class, rather. Y you never had that kind of problem where, and, and thank God they actually do have life preservers on because people always wonder, like, really are they really under those seats? Yeah. You get the yeah. Titanic thing. It's like, there are no life boats? You know, you, so you get that feeling about it. So I thought it was stunning to see that. Mm -hmm. It's very scary to see that. And you're lucky, it's, it's, it's a Christmas miracle that, Nobody was seriously injured. Mm -hmm. People with breathing problems. Kudos to the people who knew that there was actually a procedure. Like, you know, if the boat goes on fire, what are we going to do? Yeah, right. Yeah, that we're, apparently we're, did a great we're, job. We're going to bring, we're going to, it's going to be like Dunkirk. We're going to bring all these boats <laughs> and we're going to transfer people on and off and we're going to get people back to Staten Island. So kudos to everybody who was involved in that. Harbor pilots, all, all the folks, the ferry people and, and everybody else, uh, fire department, uh, police, everybody else. But yeah, you got to look and see if it's a systemic problem. Now, listen, I'm not an advocate for removing more service. That's the issue, the boat, right? Because some of these boats always seem to be in dry dock one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, you really do need to make sure that the, I mean, I guess because you have the Dorothy Day now, maybe that's the one you kind of tear that one apart a little bit and say, okay, what's the problem? Well, again, maybe it was just negligence. You know, not every boat is has the same problem. One car has a problem. You know, the other 5,000 cars are not going to have that right. same that same problem. But I mean, I mean, lucky that nothing else bad happened. Shows that you need trained people. So I understand the the union having an eye on that as well. Yeah. But it also shows you, you know, you need to have people to run these boats. And however you got to get them, I think now it's the time because before something goes really wrong on a boat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it was a great point about services already reduced enough as it is. So when we had the elected officials calling after the the fire to, to take the Alice out of service, I'm like, 
I get it. You want to make sure it's safe, but also we can barely run service as it is. So we're going to take that out. And then we're short a boat on top of being short staff. But it shows you how important that is to get that labor situation handled because you never know what could happen. Right. You know, a boat could have another problem. Two boats could hit each other and have a problem. I mean, you know, a rough landing or whatever. It's like, all right, so we're down a boat, but at least we've got the people to put the other boat. You've had to put the Alice Austin in service. You had to, you know, use those, right. the, the little boats, as we call them, mm -hmm. to, to actually be regular ferries during regular business hours. At least you have the people. The people you can generally rely on. It's the mechanical stuff sometimes is the thing that, that, that kind of can give you problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well... Thanks so much for joining me today, Tom. I'm sure there will be plenty of more ferry news to discuss in the future, and I really appreciate you coming on. And thank you for the work that you do. You, uh, you help us all out. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Staten Island Advances from the scene. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and visit silive.com for the latest on all these stories and more. Thank you for supporting local journalism.